Very nice to have you here, uh, Klaus. Welcome. Well, like I said, uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, obviously, it's a very, very important uh, sort of uh, issue we uh, we're going to talk about, and uh, which I've uh, got some uh, life experience about. So uh, I'm happy to to uh, enlighten some of, some of my uh, my life in uh, in football and in life in general. That's great. And uh, before we. Uh dive into those areas uh, you you've had a amazing career as a as a footballer and a captain of the Southampton yeah. you played in the Premier League uh, how many years was it I played on top level for 12 and a half season yeah. for Southampton yeah. uh, 10 10 years in the Premier League and two and a half years in the championship so uh, and I was club club captain for six seven years uh and obviously as a foreigner uh that's quite uh an achievement, quite an achievement uh, yeah. and obviously ending my career with a with a testimonial game as well uh it's uh, something i'm very proud about yeah, yeah. that's that's uh, great and uh, heard people say that uh, that if you're in southampton uh, everyone knows who you are and you consider the legend there well i i think uh Football in England is obviously we we all know it's huge. The Premier League it's uh, it's massive, uh, but I think uh, for me staying at the same club for such a long time, I think the English sort of supporter appreciates the loyalty and the commitment to uh, to one club, uh, which you never see. These days, these days no. so uh, staying at one club for for so many years as I did, uh, you obviously uh, gonna yeah achieve uh, legend status. Yeah, and, and before that career began, if, if you could take us a little bit back in time, uh, before a professional footballer, uh, I'm, I'm sure there was a, a young young Klaus uh, growing up in in Norway with uh, hopes and dreams. Uh, if you take us a little bit to the childhood years, uh, like who was Klaus then? Klaus was uh, a little uh, innocent little boy from uh, from a tiny little island south of Bergen. Uh, I grew up in a tiny little fishing village, I would say, um, where the main sort of industry was was fish uh, and the fishing industry. Um, did your family work work with industry? Yeah, fish? they did. My brother still yeah. works as a fisherman. Yeah. Uh, so that was very natural on uh, <clears throat> on the island and uh, in the community of of uh, of Selbjorn and Ostevold, where I where I grew up. Um, but obviously, I had uh, different uh, sort of agendas. Uh, I loved sports from uh, a very young age. Mm. Uh, obviously, football was. Uh, my main passion. Yeah. Uh, At what age did you did you start to have a great passion for the for the game of football? I was I was very young. I think mm -hmm. six seven years old. Already I uh, then, yeah, then, yeah. I I was wandering yeah. around with the ball under my yeah. arm and uh, took it to school. Yeah, right? absolutely. <laughs> okay. And obviously it the wasn't like Tom Hanks with Wilson. <laughs> no, wasn't that, bad, no. <laughs> wasn't that bad. Uh, okay. But yeah. my passion for football came yeah. early, yeah. Uh, and I also had. A grandmother, uh, born and, and raised in Liverpool. Okay. Uh, so she was English. Yeah. So part and of your family was English. Yeah. So you, you got some exposure. To I did. It. Yeah. Okay. I did. So the uh, the English game or the 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 football, the English football, mm -hmm. uh, came to me pretty quickly and early in my in my childhood. Yeah. And obviously, I supported Liverpool when I grew okay. up. That's good. Uh, good to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so uh, to to watch Liverpool last season, obviously yeah. winning the Premier League after so many years was yeah. fantastic. Even okay. though my heart is in Southampton, yeah. so yeah. Um, okay, that's great. And and and, <coughs> and when you then enter into teenage years, did you did you start to show the great talents in football, or did that come a little bit later? Can you take us through that? No, I think I was. Pretty talented mm -hmm. uh, from young age, um, but I was talented in not only football. Mm -hmm. uh, I um, 
I did a lot of other sports yeah. when I grew up. I yeah. did uh, swimming, martial arts. Yeah. Uh, Even in the young town of Estoril. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There was a big group of uh, karate kids, uh, <laughs> okay. and uh, and I think f yeah. for me, growing up in a, in that sort of community, uh, where the the freedom of the nature around you and and uh, security uh, and loving family and everything was was very secure for me and I, I, it was a lovely childhood mm. uh, but I, I think also being being good in other sports mm. uh, being active in other sports yeah. as long as you can I think that's a great advice uh, I will give, yeah. give youngsters today. To, to try out different things yeah. and, and uh, Be have different friends in different sports. And, absolutely, yeah. mm -hmm. absolutely. And I, I, uh, for me, I think being versatile or, or in other sports yeah. will only give you uh, more benefits mm -hmm. in, in the sports you want to give 100% to. Yeah. So for me to do uh, mm -hmm. martial arts, for example, or yeah. Or athletics, yeah. uh, swimming, yeah. just gave me uh, an advantage yeah. when it came to football. I see. Be because obviously the football today is is for youngsters, young young boys today. It's, it it gets serious mm. very quickly. Yeah. yeah, it's a very good good point. And and at what time did you start to then play professionally or or, or play for a bigger club and start to devote yourself completely to football? How, how old were you then? <clears throat> Well, I think uh, the fun of football and the enjoyment of football mm -hmm. is uh, uh, is something you should uh, keep as long as you can, yeah. uh, because the serious part of football comes very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, that that's why I'm saying growing up on a, a tiny little community. Uh, was an advantage for me mm -hmm. uh, to stay out there for for the years I did. Uh, obviously, I came to Bergen. I was seventeen, yeah. uh, and already then I I I was picked up by Brand Bergen. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so you played an early age for, for, for the one of the biggest club in in Norway then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I was um, I was picked up by by yeah. them when I was seventeen. Yeah. Uh, but obviously, then I came into to uh, to Brandberg and uh, in uh, in something called Team Brand at at the time, mm -hmm. and then we had twenty uh, twenty of the best talents in uh, in the region. Yeah. Uh, so uh, obviously the quality then was was a lot mm -hmm. better. I uh, see. Yeah. And, and, and looking back often can be hard uh, pinpointing what Moses were happening at, at what time but but do you think at this time you had a great childhood loved sports a lot of security then you then you start to play professionally 17 which mm. is a young age but still it's not very unusual today mm. uh, did you looking back was it was it different motions which you had towards the game or to yourself or was it was it better or worse or, or, or different? Well, I, I think what uh, looking back, uh, uh, the, obviously the question I often get as uh, after being the Norwegian who's played the most game in, in Premier League in English football, mm -hmm. and uh, is why why did you make it and mm -hmm. uh, how did you make it? Yeah. Uh, and how man how did you manage to stay on that level yeah. for so many years mm -hmm. and i think for me personally i i had um i had a, a very deep passion yeah. i had something a hunger mm -hmm. um that was uh i would i would say uh very unusual for uh a kid at my my age uh, I, I hated to lose and mm. I found that out very quickly yeah. um, but I, I learned to lose with dignity uh, early yeah. um, but I had this flame inside of me mm. of, of passion and sort yeah. of determination that mm. and that uh, that followed me the whole way yeah. of my career mm. and even does today mm. in, in a certain degree yeah. because I 
I was never happy. Mm -hmm. uh, even going from a tiny island of outside Bergen, coming to to the main club on the west coast, mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't happy. You were never satisfied. No, no, I was never satisfied. And even though I was, when I was brought to England mm -hmm. uh, by Southampton and Graham Sooners yeah. in '96, mm -hmm. um, how old were you then? Twenty-two. Twenty-two. Um, obviously, that's a childhood dream. Yeah. Uh, to to come and play in the Premier League, yeah. uh, but for me it was yeah I was ecstatic. It was yeah. fantastic, yeah. Uh, but I didn't travel over to England to uh, and and pat myself on the shoulder and say I've I've achieved it now. Oh. I've, I'm I'm happy. Yeah. I've managed to get into a Premier League club. Mm. That was never the case yeah. for me. Uh, I wanted to prove myself that I was good enough for this league and I want to stay in this league for yeah. as long as I can. So the hunger didn't do anything with the hunger? No, just not at all. Put a, put a more focus on it? Yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. uh, my determination through uh, the whole of my career mm -hmm. is, I think, the best example is, uh, is that I... I went through 10 managers yeah. uh, at Southampton mm -hmm. in 12 and a half years uh, at the professional level uh, and that's quite a lot, mm -hmm. uh, 10 managers. Yeah. Uh, but to uh, sort of emphasize my sort of determination of, of uh, uh, stay in the team and perform, uh, I've only been benched four times in my career. Mm -hmm. Four times. Yeah, that's quite quite amazing. And so mm. that's uh, yeah. I think that just proves that my um, my sort of internal flame of mm -hmm. of performing and yeah. and do as best as, as I could mm -hmm. at all times uh, has has always been with me. Yeah. Okay. And, and some people talk about this this flame and the mindset. Was it something which just came naturally to you, or did you have to? Uh, dwell on your mindset of determination and resilience, or or, or did it did it come naturally to you? It came naturally to me, but obviously I was challenged through through my career, mm -hmm. uh, obviously by managers of uh, the sort of competition of uh, of the game. Uh, for me, going from from Norway uh, to England was a massive step. Uh, a huge step, uh, um, and I remember playing in the first game, my my debut against Nottingham Forest at home at the Dell um, in '96, and I I was halfway through the first half, and I, I thought to myself, how the hell am I going to going to survive in this league? Because oh, the was so yeah, the, yeah, the the fastness and the 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 fitness, the yeah. sort of. Mm. Uh, yeah, the the quickness of of the game, the yeah. uh, physical side of the game was yeah. was unbelievable, mm -hmm. and I thought, and I was a I was a centre half, um, I was good on the ball, I was quick, mm -hmm. uh, and my sort of trade was uh, playing up from the back, uh, but I remember receiving the ball, split seconds later, smash. Uh, didn't have any room to play. No, no time at all. Yeah. So uh, I needed to learn very quickly. Mm. Um, so it kept you on the ads um, in, in that sense that you were uh, you were always up for the challenge and, and, and the challenge of you in a way. Yeah, yeah I always had to uh, to prove myself mm. if you uh, if you like to mm. uh, to make sure that I stayed in the team and mm -hmm. I, uh, I was one of the, the leaders that I, uh, I wanted to be. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but uh, I think a lot of players coming from different, different leagues, uh, different countries, mm -hmm. coming into the Premier League, yeah. the English football, uh, will find it quite tough to begin with because the, the quickness of the mm -hmm. game, yeah. it, it's uh, and the quality of it, obviously. Mm -hmm. Playing in the and and professionally for so lots a long time in, in the best league of the world, uh, came with many of different challenges, uh, and you've been open about that as well. Like uh, uh, your 
challenges in life, uh, how your mental health and life quality suffered, mm. even though from the outset you couldn't see the consequences on the on the pits. So, so can you take us through that a little bit? When, when did, uh, when did your life start to change in the direction that, that, um, that uh, there were more life challenges for you and you started to uh, suffer? Well, I, I don't think I would say I, I suffered or I, um, <clears throat> I had. A I had difficulties uh, uh, more than others uh, mm -hmm. while I was playing. Um, I think my um, my struggles and my mental health and my sort of addiction problems mm -hmm. with alcohol and drugs um, came after I was finished. Mm -hmm. um, but what I would mention and what I think it's important to talk about today and uh, which is not very often talked about in professional mm -hmm. football is the use of uh, of strong pain painkillers mm -hmm. uh, opiates um, uh, at the time and when I came over obviously as a 22 year old boy I, I was naive and I was mm -hmm. uh, just follow the the club, the players, and and uh, the the medical staff, and mm -hmm. and uh, everything that that followed the, uh, being at the Premier League club. Um, but uh, using as much as painkillers as why as we did mm -hmm. uh, at the time, I I didn't think about it. Uh, but looking back today. Uh, for me, it, it was not good, mm -hmm. um, but it was the way uh, every club mm -hmm. and and every player was treated. Yeah. To to keep you fit and keep you on the pitch every mm -hmm. Saturday at three o'clock. So, uh, so when you think back, you you uh, been open about that alcohol uh, alcohol and drug abuse. Yeah, uh, after my career. Yeah. After your career, what it. Do you think that maybe when you look back that you get a you get a um, some sense of uh, the effectiveness of drugs with first the use of the painkillers that mm. that you were that there was some pattern which developed there that you okay you were extremely tired or you were in pain and then you had the painkillers and then then it starts to build season after season that some people talk about that looking into different painkillers and that becomes a little bit a a coping, coping, coping mechanism. mechanism. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, I think, like I said, I, th I think it, it it turned out badly for me, and I I remember very well my first sort of exposure to morphine, mm -hmm. uh, because I've been through seventeen operations, uh, seventeen surgeries, sixteen of those has been football uh, injuries. Yeah. Uh, so my tolerance for painkillers, my tolerance for the the morphine, um, I remember very well. Mm -hmm. Even today, I remember my first exposure to to morphine, and that did something to my head. Yeah. Um, but obviously, at the time, you mm -hmm. you you don't think about it because you just want to perform, yeah. and you're in that bubble of performing. Mm -hmm every single waking moment yep. uh, as a professional footballer so um, and, and uh, so so if we if we look at the um, uh, at the development of, of the addiction um, mm. um, the, first to the painkillers and then then there is an alcohol use which starts to increase at some point in your life and then some experimentation with narcotica, mm. but that was, as you described, more controlled. And and then it you you talk about it being more uncontrolled after the career. Can you would you be willing to share that with us? Like the usage <coughs> of alcohol, and narcotica during in the time you played, and then and how that developed. Uh, yeah, I, I obviously. Like I explained, uh, to 
to eat slow painkillers was was a normal thing for for every player, mm-hmm. all the players, uh, because we have we had aches and pains all the time, mm-hmm. uh, so that was natural uh, and nothing unusual with that, uh, and that happens today, and that was always will be in the game, mm-hmm. uh, because it's a physical tough tough uh, tough work, yeah. um, uh, but for me. Uh, what happened when I retired um, uh, changed everything. Uh, but everything changed with um, uh, a depression I went into. Um, because losing, being in the professional game over 20 years at the time, and when I had to retire because of an injury on my ankle, uh, I was 35 years old. Um, I ended my career with a testimonial game, which is something very, very special uh, to achieve in English football. Uh, and I was there being cheered on and, and sort of looked up to for, for 20,000 20, people that night uh, who was all there for me. Um, but what hit me after I retired, uh, I could never have saw mm. foresight. I, 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 uh, so it's I, extreme I, change from being yeah. in the arena, admired, adored, the adrenaline uh, to, to maybe basically nothing. Yeah, that's how you feel. Yeah. Uh, and I've described it many times as going into a black hole. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, and I think the most important thing uh, for me at the time that I felt uh, nobody needed me anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, that you were non-important. Yeah. Was, that a, was that a thought? And, uh, as you that, know, that, as was, you... that, that was obviously uh, a thought that I felt because I've lost the dressing room. Mm-hmm. I've lost the most important thing in my life, and that was my teammates and you the dressing room. You were a captain, you, were, you had a responsibility, people looked up to you. Yeah. And then, and then it was over. Did you then think I'm I'm not an important uh, person anymore? Was that was that the thought with you? That was, you, which was yeah, it was around? yeah. That yeah. was the feeling, and uh, obviously I made some bad decisions, mm-hmm. um, and I I got involved in a lot of charity work and a lot of foundation work with the club and yeah. and with uh, other. You kept on, on trying to involve in the club, yeah. uh, seeking that importance, uh, Absolutely. Uh, having, a, having a value, uh, but still, um, as you go over your story, you were, you were um, bothered by the thought that you were not important. Mm. Were an, uh, any more thoughts or emotions at the time which you can recollect which were strong? Well, the was it like I, I should have never left Östervold, or I should have, no. I should have, no. or like uh, I never, I, I never have no. those sort of no. thoughts. I I was very proud of what I've mm. achieved, yeah. uh, but I found myself lost. Yeah. Um, Who am I? Was that a yeah? Was that I, a, a, a thought of, of lack of purpose. Has, lack of purpose. Uh, mm. And then, uh, obviously, with the depression. Uh, and there was a heavy depression that I uh, I suffered. Uh, Can you take us through that a little bit? Because uh, I know that you work in the field, and and you you, I know that you know, and we know both on the depression, or, or the symptoms of it, and how mm. how it can be. Can you take us uh, through a normal days when you had it the worst? Did you have problems getting up? Uh, up in the day, or can you can you if we would zoom in 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 a couple of days in your life when you had it the worst, could you could you go over them with us? I certainly can, mm. um, and I've talked I've talked about this uh, quite a lot, mm. obviously, for to to accept it, and obviously to um, to. Uh, to manage life after football and um, and and getting help, getting treatment. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I will give you an example. I will give you what happens when I stood there in front of twenty thousand people that night on my testimonial game. 
Um, less than nine months later, I woke up every morning sweating, uh, shaking. Um, and I had to start the day with a huge glass of pure vodka mm. just to start the day, just to get going. And that took less than a year. Um, and ironically, I, um, I had everything. I had millions in my bank. I had a lot of money. Uh, I had a speedboat in Miami. I had a sailing boat in Norway, a, a great luxury apartment here in Bergen. I had everything. A great family, a great wife, two fantastic children, three cars and outside. Uh, but I was, I was lost. I, I was, I was crying every day. I, I was so down. Uh, and obviously, all the charity work and everything I, I did um, was to fill the gap of uh, what I've lost. Um, and then I found, after a while, I found cocaine. Mm -hmm. uh, so you were seeking the alcohol, the painkillers, and then... Yeah, and then I, I sort of managed the day with sort of different prescription uh, medications, mm -hmm. found cocaine and, and thought, wow, I found something here who can replace maybe running out to 50,000 people every week. So you got the high. So I got the high. Yeah. Uh, but how wrong was I? I, mm -hmm. I, I it was, in less than a year after I sort of discovered cocaine, uh, I was lucky to be alive. Because for me, with the alcohol, with the prescription drugs and the cocaine, I, I wouldn't have survived. I wouldn't, I would be dead if I didn't get help when I got help. Um, and when my family left me with my two girls, I sort of accepted it mm -hmm. because um, I've accepted for myself that I was so so low down and so lost um, that I wanted to drink myself to death. I, I wanted to disappear. Well, it's at a low, low level that, that you thought maybe that you deserved it uh, in the way of, of the other Yeah, I, 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 I couldn't see a way out. No. Um, and I was in and out of rehab clinics. So I was arrested countless times. I was drink driving. I was, I was doing all the wrong things. Uh, and I soon discovered that uh, this sort of life will kill me. Mm -hmm. And it will kill me pretty quickly. Uh, and what you talk about here is that, um, which we know, uh, many people have been, been talking about when self destructiveness hits you. Mm. So uh, and how you describe it, there's a like behavior of self destructiveness. Mm. So mm. so did you do you think that at that time, it's like that was that was guiding you that you thought that now you ruined this and then you just kept on destroying yourself purposely or what? Yeah, I, I, I took my determination and what I've talked about mm. achieving as a footballer into, into uh, yeah, using, mm. using drugs and using... So when uh, Klaus does something, he does it he properly. He does it properly, yeah. yeah. So I, I, uh, I used professionally. <laughs> in a way and I had the funds to do it mm. um, but I couldn't I couldn't see a way out and obviously um, that was my thought of drink myself to death that that was I would never come back if I've made made it on that plane mm -hmm. I would have been dead today I'm, I'm very sure of that so Thank you very much for sharing, Klaus. Uh, I, I, uh, it's, uh, it's hard to, uh, to, to share. Well, it's, it's going back to, uh, 
to the years that I uh, I lost myself and I I, I lost everything around me and uh, um, but obviously eventually I, I was I've been hit so many times uh, rock bottom that I gave up mm -hmm. I so, completely gave up uh, so this one one way ticket to Rio or, um, like that was at a time I assume when when your wife to at that time took took they've left me they left you and um, you were feeling feeling uh, very low um, what happened did you not get the plane I never managed to to board the plane I was so drunk and I uh, I've overslept and I've uh, so you're grateful as well with that. I'm very grateful. I've I've never made that uh, made that trip. Obviously, uh, I wouldn't have said that today. Um, and um, for me, for me, uh, I, I I of course I don't know you so well. I, we're getting to know one another uh, uh, just a little bit before. Now we talk, and even more now when we talk. But you come across to me as a very uh, healthy individual with a lot of good values for society just before mm. we were talking you were you were running and playing outside and, and working so so and i assume you've always been you've been that person so uh, having that mixed thoughts when you were doing all those bad bad things to yourself yeah i think you knew it i shouldn't be doing this. i did i and did maybe that hits you even stronger because it was so far away from the values which you uh, um, can you can you talk us through that a little bit like uh, sure did, sure did that uh, affect you absolutely and that's why I I said through my childhood I had uh, so much love and compassion from my my family I was safe I was the the togetherness and 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 the true simple values I would say of life mm -hmm. uh, I've learnt uh, and I had that in me all the way um, and in many ways that saved my life mm -hmm. um, because obviously uh, playing in, in in the Premier League or playing in that sort of bubble uh, for such a long time as I, I, I managed to do uh, which I'm incredibly proud of Mm -hmm. uh, and no other Norwegian have, have, have played more mm -hmm. games in England than me. Uh, so my legacy is, is there as a footballer. Uh, but afterwards, that uh, yeah, it's. I think the uh, uh, the help I needed to get. Um, it was not one thing that I could put uh, or, or say that saved me. It was it was a few things, and one was that I've given up. I've, I've given up life. Uh, the family's left me. I've, I've accepted. Uh, so sort of, I want to die. Mm -hmm. um, I had uh, many experience of of uh, being going into rehab. Uh, my my heart my heart stopped. I, I had a heart attack of overdose of cocaine, um, and uh, but I want to say I want to talk about a little bit of what. Um, made me turn it around mm. that's that would be very interesting to hear and and as we know we work both in the field there there are many people who who, who share your pain and mm. share what you're going through and and that would be very interesting for for us to hear what what it was which which started to give you a little bit hope of getting better and one wanting to change yeah <sighs> With all the guilt and all the shame who comes with it, um, 
I've built that up through these years and obviously towards my family and I recognised that I hurt my family and I, I hurt everybody who loves me, around me. And as, as being a loving person, as being uh, a conscious uh, man of treating everyone around me very nicely and I, I, love, I love being that person but I needed to find that little boy Klaus again mm-hmm. um, because I lost him somewhere uh, in this and um, but like I said when I hit rock bottom so many times and when I gave up there was a little flame inside me who couldn't justify um, dying, mm. who couldn't justify my two little girls growing up without a dad. Um, but I had to break down uh, a certain amount of ego, a certain amount of... Uh, what would I say? The being a professional footballer is is uh, you've been look, looked up to, and you you get confirmations of that all the time. Um, and I had to break that down. Mm-hmm. I had to find my vulnerable side again. And um, was it in a way that you you wanted to? Uh give yourself a more slack of, of saying, okay, I'm not a captain in my own life anymore. I'm, uh, I'm on the bench here. I'm, I'm not doing so well. I, I, I need help. Was it? Well, I, I think after a while, uh, well, first I would say what, what helped me massively was finding uh, the tears finding uh, to break down I needed to break down um, I needed to break down in front of my family mm-hmm. so they could see that I was sick I needed help um, and I needed them to see that I've accepted uh, where I was and the problems I was in mm-hmm. um, so the first time I broke down in front of my two girls. How old were they at the time? They were uh, nine and six. Uh, and obviously they didn't see anything. They haven't been traumatized or anything, they, but they've seen dad being sick. Uh, but they couldn't understand what, what was happening. But for me to break down in front of them and cry together with them, and I had saved up so many liters of tears Mm -hmm. uh, through my career, being the proud footballer I was, Mm -hmm. uh, to to break down and and, and show that, show that vulnerability gave me hope. Mm -hmm. Uh, Another factor that gave gave me a lot of hope was meeting somebody who could recognize my pain mm-hmm. because the pain I, I I was suffering or the pain I felt with the depression and everything I wanted to kill myself I, I wanted to disappear because I felt that I was a burden for everyone mm-hmm. uh, but also what gave me hope was meeting a guy called Peter K. Uh, who's not with us today. Uh, yeah, rest in peace. Uh, he he saved my life. He's one of the best mates of Tony Adams. Mm-hmm. And he set up a clinic just outside London um, who was obviously treating ex-footballers, ex-sportsmen who have... Uh, derailed and 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 uh, found themselves in the position I was in. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when Peter K came to me, and I didn't know anything about Peter K at all, uh, but I knew Tony obviously uh, from the football. 
And, and Peter Kay uh, agreed to drive down to me in Southampton. Uh, didn't know anything about him. But he came down to Southampton one afternoon. Uh, and uh, I invited him in and, and we just went into the living room and, and, and sat down in, in, in two chairs and just looked at each other. And we both started crying. And I've never experienced that before. Because I could see somebody who had experienced my pain. And that was the first time I've, I've experienced. Mm. Here was somebody who's been through what I've, I've been through or what I'm sitting with. And that gave me hope. Um, and that's one of the main reasons I do what I do today. Um, to give something back. Mm -hmm. Because that is a massive importance of, I think, in mental health, in, in, uh, in uh, drug addiction, um, to relate to others who's been through it and made it mm -hmm. and can, can live healthy, good lives without drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to look at what they've done right. Uh, so Peter was then someone you looked up to, you could see he could relate to your pain. Mm. Did he share a similar story as you? Yeah. Did he, yeah. yeah. But he he, no. did, he had he had uh, been sober and did he did he manage to get out of his problems at the time? He did, and he was sober for nearly twenty years before he died. Mm. But he. He was not a sportsman. He owned three um, three uh, top restaurants in London, Michelin restaurants in London. Mm -hmm. uh, and to cope with all that pressure, he uh, he got addicted to alcohol and cocaine and prescription uh, tablets yeah. like me. Mm -hmm. So the similarity was there. Um, But he, unfortunately, Peter suffered a lot of internal problems with his organs mm. and had to remove quite a lot of them uh, or big parts of them. So uh, Peter didn't live very long, mm. unfortunately. Uh, but without a doubt, without Peter K, uh, um, I'm not sure I've, I would sit here today. Um, because that was such an important thing for me to to experience somebody else who's who, who's felt my pain, and and obviously managed to uh, get out of it. That's that's one thing, mm -hmm. and that's probably the easiest thing mm -hmm. to get out of it and get clean. But to live clean, that's a whole different story. It's a different different ball game. Yeah, and spe so, and so especially after, yeah. After that, did you then move into rehabilitation with a different mindset that you that you um, had the experience with Peter and others that that you had a higher optimism or higher determinism in rehabilitation to stay clean? Absolutely. I, obviously, this saved my life, mm -hmm. and uh, yes, this gave me hope and. It gave me a determination again to uh, to get well and and to get healthy again. Mm -hmm. um, and many people uh, talked about addiction that uh, that often others who haven't suffered that addiction they they, they say that, that the whole job is just staying clean, but that's the most important job. But it's not the only job, uh, and you no. need to do so many other things. So, what journey did you then embark on when you started? Uh, managed to stay clean. What? What? How? How did you? Uh, how did you keep on working with yourself? It's an incredible journey, um, and that's the journey of life. That it's so fascinating and so dangerous um, because getting clean for the first time, uh, which I did uh, at the clinic with Peter. Um, Yes, it gave me a, no, a lot of hope and encouragement, but I, I knew very little of how to live 
clean, how to live without alcohol and drugs. Mm-hmm. Um, so the years after, I, I managed to stay drug free for uh, two, two and a half years. And, and what I would say is when I relapsed, because I, uh, I've had two relapses, and both of them nearly killed me. Uh, the second one, I tried to kill myself. I cut my main blood vein in my arm, and I nearly died. Um, and that was the guilt and the shame who did to me, because I've. You were ashamed that you had another relapse and, and that you, you were Yeah, and, and this was just after I I stood in front of a whole nation in Norway and and explained and told them I, I'm i a drug, drug addict. Um, but did you uh, say then you're clean now and then you had yeah, a relapse? And yeah. Was and it the same that you... Um, shame and the negative thoughts, but... Came flooding over you. Absolutely, and it was so. It was so depressing and so hard to deal with that I didn't see any any way out. Mm-hmm. Then disappear. Uh, luckily, I survived again, uh, and they saved my life. And but looking back to those two uh, relapses that nearly killed me. Um, that was extremely important for me sitting here today because I needed to, for myself, um, experience that um, because I thought, uh, to be perfectly honest, I thought I could do do it a little bit different because I was who I was. And that was the little percentage I had, maybe half a percent of when I left that clinic uh, after the months I was there, getting clean and getting back to a, a healthy life. I thought when I went to the AA meetings, the NA meetings and and, and, and got involved in the 12 step uh, sort of uh, recovery process, I had a little percentage saying that I could do it a little bit different. Because you had achieved the, the career in football, you had high yeah. confidence in, in maintaining and executing a plan. <coughs> you thought that you could cut corners and yeah. uh, in, in, in staying clean. Yeah, uh, but cheating a little bit mm. when I wanted. Um, and that for me was that's why I'm describing having the relapse uh, like I did and uh, learning to recognize those triggers Mm -hmm. uh, for yourself uh, ending up where I ended up Mm -hmm. um, was life-saving but also nearly killed me Mm -hmm. twice and I needed to experience this to 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 accept that I was as vulnerable as everybody else and I couldn't you're not different no I'm not different than any any other drug addict at no. all no. Um, what, I, ab- what about uh, today Klaus uh, are you you are clean yes yes oh, great uh, and uh, and what about today in regards to your um, thoughts about yourself like you talked about previous uh, shame and mm. uh, how, how do you think about yourself today well, I'm proud. I'm uh, uh, I'm very humble and and thankful for uh, for the life I I have today. Mm-hmm. I I've lost all my money. Uh, I've I live from month to month. Financially, I I, I uh, made huge amounts of money. 
Uh, I've lived, lived the boyhood dream. Um, I've achieved so much. I've done so much uh, in football, in life, traveled the world uh, so many times. And then uh, the sort of experiences of, of what I've been through has been incredible. Uh, and I'm so grateful for that. But to for me today to give something back of that's that's why I'm 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 so incredible passionate about what I'm doing today mm-hmm. and to to help others mm-hmm. um, has always been something deep inside of me mm-hmm. that I I the joy of life for me is is to to uh, spread joy mm-hmm. or spread happiness or or through my life experience, through my addiction problems, through my mental health problems, uh, to give hopes to others. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why I love so much what I'm doing today. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's something I'm, which you derive meaning from, that after your experiences you, you, you feel a need and, and a must to... to uh, to uh, help give, others, give yeah, back. to give something back, and and with my life experience, uh, and with obviously the the person I've been uh, as a footballer, uh, maybe there's a lot of people that still look up to up to me what I've achieved as a footballer, but that's not important to me anymore. Uh, it's the person Klaus who. Who uh, who's important and and that person is what's important for what I'm doing today mm-hmm. and and for all the people I'm uh, I'm helping. Um, so That's great. Can you you want to share a little bit about what you're doing today? Uh, I know you're very passionate about mental health, and do you wanna do you wanna tell us a little bit about that? How yeah, you I've, sports and mental health and I've, activities. And, I've, it's something that I've uh, I've done now for for six years. I've uh, I worked for the psychiatry alliance here in uh, in Bergen, um, and uh, what we are doing uh, is to uh, to get people with mental health issues or mental health uh, problems, uh, people from isolation, loneliness. Um, come to us, or drug addicts, or 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 people who are struggling in general. Mm-hmm. Everyone is welcome to us. Um, and what we do um, is to uh, to give them. Uh, we've got twenty different activities through the week, mm-hmm. um, through physical activities. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's all from football, uh, climbing, to swimming, to uh, yoga, to uh, Sumba, to there's there's a whole variety of activities. So helping people out of loneliness, isolation, activities, socializing. Yeah, socializing. Mm. And I think uh, physical activity, we know a lot about mm. uh, how the brain is reacting to physical activity mm. and how we produce these sort of uh, uh, yeah the the lucky sort of uh, uh, serotonin and, and, and all these uh, dopamine uh, in the brain mm. uh, but what I will also say um, which is as important as as the physical activity is the togetherness mm. is is is, together. is is coming together mm-hmm. and have that bond have that sort of socializing um, that is as important as the, mm-hmm. the 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 activity but we do train and we train proper mm-hmm. but uh, the main reason for how we got as big as we are today because we are probably the biggest um, sort of uh, alternative for uh, or 
uh, mental health in Bergen mm. uh, is that all our trainers, we got about 40 odd trainers, uh, all the staff, everyone who's uh, uh, working for us has got uh, their own experience with mm. mental health or drug issues. Mm. So we believe, or I believe, uh, going back to Peter K, mm. if you remember, uh, having that uh, relationship, that connection, building that relation to these people who come to us for the first time, there's never, never anything from above and down to mm. anyone. It's a credibility and uh, experience we, of people being equal. Yeah, so, and they can come to us, and 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 uh, mm. and we will never ask where they come from, which di- diagnosis they have, or what no. illness they have, yeah. anything. Yeah. We they will come to us to train, mm-hmm. and and be equal, and be uh, a part of something uh, bigger than mm. just themselves. It's a great initiative. Going back to uh, yourself and. Um, um, if you if you look at your career when um, when things start to go down, you say after after you after you stop the career, if you could have given yourself advice, um, if we had a time machine mm. and old, old um, Klaus, which is sitting here today, could talk to Klaus, which was mm. having that last game, and you could get in half an hour mm. with yourself, what, what kind of advice would you want to give yourself? Um, I think the the most important advice I I would uh, give myself would be to find something meaningful to wake up to every morning. Mm. To actively seeking for me. To um, to have something to go to. Mm-hmm. Um, to get up in the morning and have something that gives you something mm. that makes uh, gives your day a, a purpose mm-hmm. um, is probably the best advice I could I could give and I, I think uh, working also with the PFA in in Norway and and with all athletes who's been in the game as long as I was lucky to be in the game uh, when they finish, they will find it difficult, mm. regardless of what they say. They will find it difficult, um, and to to adjust to to a life outside that bubble of performing, mm. you need to find something that gives you something during the day. Um, and prepare for transitions, many transitions in life, especially going from a professional to not professional or, or it's even, difficult. even things married to divorce yeah. uh, all these transitions uh, we read about them we can see them mm. but but it's very hard to prepare for them it is it is and and you can't really prepare for them mm. because i was i was thinking that i've i'm, I'm quite a clued up guy I've, i'm sort of been club captain for southampton mm. for six seven years and i knew i had to retire mm. I was prefer- prepared to to uh, hang my boots up, mm. uh, but what hit me, I was not prepared for. Mm. So, um, but when it comes to advice, yeah, that will be the most important advice yeah. I would do. And and today, as we know, uh, both from the statistics and and also experience, uh, was working in the mental health field. Uh, mental health problems, largest health problem mm. in the Nordics and in Europe. Yeah. Uh, politicians and society often forgets it, uh, uh, but no other health problem is so costly. <laughs> and and we see that problems are on the rise. Um, and no one can really say that that's the factor. There are many, many possible factors which are contributing to that. But if you could pick out society today of why we have mental rise of mental health problems what what could that be i think there's there's many factors i think uh, is it the meaningfulness is it that uh, among uh, everything we are in society today that we lose sometimes the the purpose and the purpose it, yeah I, I, I think that's one of the things obviously but i think 
uh, living in Norway, which I do, and, and uh, experienced life in, in many different countries. And, and uh, but what we are struggling with in this country uh, is the generation of being perfect. Mm-hmm. Is People have too high expectations of themselves. Yeah, and yeah. that's been uh, created by us. Mm-hmm. Created by... Uh, the social media, by... Uh, the social by media, and this, as I got two girls, obviously, mm-hmm. 21 17 today. Yeah. Uh, and I have to say... Uh, what I've said earlier, I've, I've never had a bad, bad, better relationship with my girls than I do today mm. uh, because of my uh, openness and, and mm. uh, we've been talked a lot about mm. this. And um, But I can see on them, in the job I'm doing, uh, all these young girls and, and, and boys struggling to, to achieve what's uh, out there on social media mm-hmm. uh, because they will there's so many arenas they need to perform at mm-hmm. it's school it's being good at sports it's uh, looking uh, as good as possible it's mm-hmm. being fit as possible it's, it's so many things mm-hmm. they they've been pressurized on mm-hmm. through social media and through the, the society we live in today mm. um, and that's one of the the biggest I would say the biggest problems we got in the society today, today because Norway is a, it's a rich country mm. it's it's a it's a country with so much money and, and so much wellness in in, in uh, uh, that we're a little bit brainwashed I think mm. um, to be perfectly honest and to and and for me, um, what was essential for me after all this was to learn for myself again to be happy with the small sort of day-to-day uh, achievements mm-hmm. uh, to maybe help my girls with their homework mm-hmm. drive them to practice yeah. drive them do small little small things. things having a conversation over dinner uh, to 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 be happy with the small things mm-hmm. in in day to day life mm. is is uh, because everyone is or so many people is uh, for me when I said I was never happy there's far too much of that today in business in general uh, and there's so many parents who never give their children. An arena to talk mm. about what they actually feel. Mm. Um, so, um, which we which we see every day, mm. and uh, I think, um, yeah, um, because everyone's got mental health. Mm. Everyone will go through mm. some sort of. Uh, depression, some sort of loss, some mm. sort of uh, difficulties yeah. during their life. Mm. And it's how you sort of uh, deal with it, mm. but learn from it and get through it and use your experience to uh, to not go back. Mm. Well, Klaus, uh those were great final words. It's been uh, great to have you with us here today. Very powerful story. I think uh, many people are going to be uh, very happy to hear that you shared your story. It's it's painful, but it's true mm-hmm. and, and powerful. And and, and it, I, I know it's going to inspire people. Thanks Thank very you. much. Mm-hmm. Thanks very much for sharing. Perfect. Thank you.